And now something completely different. Good afternoon. I'm speaking to you live just outside. The- I like to think balding is just God's way of saying, now let's see you get laid. Is it true that if you don't use it, you lose it? What I'd really like to do is put the greatness of this man in perspective. The Halos community has a lot to be thankful for, having you as a spokesperson. You mean you just call this guy up? About life and about reality. And now, America's number one reality radio show for men. Live from Los Angeles, it's Spencer Cobrin's The Ball Truth. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for hanging out while we're having some uh, typical technical issues. But, you know, we're all hooked up here. And we are ready to go. Great to be back on another Tuesday night doing the Hair Loss Show. And listen, if you don't know who I am or why I'm here, if you're new to this broadcast, if this is the first time that you're tuning in, either through uh, iHeartRadio or iTunes Radio, or if you're watching the broadcast and trying to figure out what this is... um, I'm a consumer advocate for men and women dealing with hair loss. I am the author of the um, Bald Truth and the Truth About Women's Hair Loss, uh, actually the two most read books on the subject of the prevention and treatment of hair loss in the world. We are, or I am, published in five languages and, um, you know, not some guy out here trying to sell you anything. In 1998, I was published by uh, Pocket Books, imprint of Simon & Schuster, because I decided to um, really expose the dark underbelly of the hair loss industry. I have been dealing with hair loss for more than 30 years. If you're watching the broadcast for the first time, you'll notice that I I have, you know, uh, a decent amount of hair on my head. But you need to know that this is a partial sham. I've been lucky enough to slow the progression of my hair loss using FDA-approved medication. I've been lucky enough to be able to, you know, maintain enough hair to kind of dummy it up. I wear a little makeup in the back, a lot of hair, you know, blow drying, slight comb over, I guess. And there you go. I'm a 52-year-old guy, almost, in about two weeks, uh, who has a relatively full head of hair because I made, I guess, the right moves. I was also... You know, I guess lucky enough that the medication I'm currently been using uh, Proscar, which is a, uh, a higher dose of uh, the better known drug Propecia, uh, for 20 some odd years, and slowed things down for me. Genetically, maybe I wasn't predisposed to being a Norwood Six, so I mean, I have all of the I guess all the stars aligned perfectly for me. And I also somehow had the wherewithal not to jump in the surgery when doctors wanted to perform hair transplant surgery on me back in 1988. So this is why we're here. We're here to talk about not only, obviously, I'm not just here to talk about what I've done in the industry or about my own uh, hair loss struggle, but we're here to give you guys a platform to discuss a subject that society just doesn't allow guys to talk about. Two-thirds of you by the age of 35 will suffer with some degree of hair loss. It's the way it is. You know, I read a post on uh, our message forum, Ball Truth Talk, I think it was today or yesterday, and it was from a guy, young guy who thought that, you know what, he expected to start to lose his hair in his 40s, but did not expect to start to lose his hair as a late teen just hit him out of nowhere. So it's important that everyone know this is not to put fear into you guys, but no one's safe. This is not a, a niche market. This is the largest demographic of all humankind. So we're here to take your calls. We're here to answer your questions. Uh, I'm also here to introduce my partner in crime, the original hair transplant mentor, live from Vancouver, British Columbia. It's Joe Tillman. Hey, hey Joe. Hey, how's it going? I, you know what? I can't complain. It was really weird. It was interesting, the dynamic of how the technology, you just never know what's going to happen. For some yeah. reason, through one of my Skype lines, I was actually hearing the program back from Andrew instead of you. So that was predictable as hair loss. You were, yeah, exactly. You were essentially hearing a loop 
That's why it sounded like we were out, you were talking to someone on a merry-go-round. Yeah, it was like we we're talking like this, and then yeah. it would come back. That's the way it sounded. That's, the music, everything. And that's what happens, man. And no one understands, like, you know, they think, well, I guess things are easier now. You know, people go on Facebook Live or other live services where they just turn on their smartphone and they're broadcasting live. But they have no fucking clue how difficult it is to do what we do. No. And you know no, what? No I guess that's why so few people do it. Well, I was going to say, it's like if, if it were as easy as it looked, then everyone would be doing it or a lot of people would be doing it. Not that people haven't tried. That's true. And failed. That's, but that's, that that's a different true. story. Let me give out the phone number, 888-659-3727. Um, we have some phone calls, so let's get to the phones first, and okay. then we could possibly discuss whatever's on your mind. I know you probably have something there's, to talk There's about. a couple things on my mind, actually. Actually, me too. I'm pissed, by the way. We'll talk about that later. 888 <laughs> 7 Guys, any questions, concerns about your hair loss, this is your safe place. Give us a call. Let's see who this is. Hey, you're on the air. Who's this, and where are you calling from? Uh, this is uh, John from upstate New York. John from upstate New York. How you doing today, man? Hello, John. Yeah, I'm all right. Um, I had um, three hair transplants. Well, you don't ask how I am or how Joe is? What's, what's... Oh. <laughs> man, <laughs> selfish. <laughs> Holy God. Wow. Where all, do you guys come all from? All these guys want is help. <laughs> Go ahead, John. I'm just busting Me, me, me. Yeah. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> um, I had a total of three transplants done when I was, uh, I'm 50 now, when I was 30. Um, I had like uh, linear grafts, like about 700 of them done, and it didn't work out that great. So, so linear, gra linear grafts, there's only, there were only like three guys doing linear grafts. So, and, and right. the guy that actually invented the linear graft was Dr. Gary Hitzig. So what you're telling me is that you went to see, he, would you say you were a casualty of Dr. Hitzig or was it okay procedure? I'm not going to say who I went to. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. uh, I'm assuming if you're mentioning linear graphs that that's the case. But go ahead. And um, it didn't go very well. And it kind of. And by the way, if, if Gary Hitzig is listening, look, you know you invented the linear graph. And you know I'm right. So I'm not, I'm not saying anything out of turn here. Let the poor man speak. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, John. Go ahead. Okay. And that was like when I was around 30. And then when, you know, I started losing a lot. After that, then I obviously lost what he gave me back in, when I was 30. So, like, around probably around 2012, um, I went to another surgeon in, uh, in New York, and he did the follicular units. He did um, probably around 2,000 um, follicular units, and then he also mixed them in with the dense follicular units, probably about three or four hundred to give the appearance. So you mean like like front. like couple follicular units or like basically um, double mi mini graphs. Follicular unit graphs. Yeah. yeah. Double. Yeah. And to give the illusion that, you know, the front hairline was full. And uh, it worked out okay the first one, but I didn't obviously have enough coverage. And then another year later, I went back and got an another one done. Um, I got less this time because the doctor was very conservative. Right. And his um, theory was that, um, you know, the blood supply is very, you know, if you do like a massive, like five or 6,000 grafts, that the blood supply is not good enough and that you're going to end up losing a lot of hair. So he just was extra, you know, conservative, which I wasn't too happy about. Well, I, and, I think, and I don't mean to cut you off, Joe said that I should let you speak, but I mean, Joe um, has a position on this now and it's a little bit of a stronger position than he used to have or a different position i should say as far as yeah. having a large you know these very large sessions joe why don't you explain because I, john I, whoever performed the surgery might not have been overly conservative just may it may have just been appropriate in his mind to perform a smaller surgery as opposed to risking a lot of graphs in one shot yeah and so um when we're talking about uh, these these big mega sessions that that are that you'll you'll find out there on the on the interwebs. I used to be a big proponent of them, but because um, because of the numbers of failures I've seen over my career, um, I've, I'm of the opinion that these super 
super, we'll call them super mega sessions, um, are a bad idea because if you go for one of these procedures where you get 5,000 graphs in, in one session or 6,000 graphs or what have you, and it doesn't work out, then you've essentially just hooped yourself out of, you know, however many didn't grow. I've seen cases where maybe 10% grew. I've seen cases where 50% grew and every area above and beyond and in between those two points. Um, and every, every time, um, when the patient comes back and they want to get some sort of, um, you know, repair or redo or whatever you want to call it, they've essentially wasted a significant portion of their donor hair trying to get this one and done type of result, which in my opinion, at this point in time is, um, how can I put this? It's not a myth, but I think it's a, quite frankly, it's too much of a gamble. Um, my position is that smaller procedures are better. Um, the idea that you get more scarring uh, for multiple procedures is inconsequential simply because no one's having 19 procedures. They might have three instead of two, right? So I think that the the issue of additional scarring because of multiple smaller procedures versus one larger procedure is a cop out and excuse to do a bigger procedure, which in the end is not great for the patient. It doesn't benefit the patient. If you, if you have to wait an extra year for that second surgery to be performed and to mature, it definitely benefits the clinic when they get more money from you up front. And if it works out, then they get another, you know, air quotes, home run result that they can, they well, can talk about. And I think it's important that John heard that because he seemed, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, that you were disappointed that you didn't get a lot of graphs in one shot. But Well, the thing, the thing I was disappointed about is that the doctor said that he did like 2,100 graphs, and he said that it was a total of like 4,300 hairs altogether. So technically he was kind of cheating and saying that he did move a, a lot of hair but only did like 2,100 graphs. So it's like... It's, 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 it's not a, cheating, John, because, sorry, what, what he's, you know, forgive me, I don't know your, your specific details, but the average follicular unit, assuming it was a, a, a proper follicular unit graft, will have 2.2, 2.4 hairs each. And so if you move 2,100 graphs, then it is an average of, say, 4,200, 4,300 hairs. So it's... Right. I, I don't think it's cheating or trying to be disingenuous yeah. or misleading. I think it's being honest. Right. Um, well, the bottom line right now is that I only have about 2,000 probably graphs left that I'm able to do. And I'm totally bald in the back, and I need a lot more done in the front. Yeah. So I had a ton of donor area. So obviously he didn't, cons he didn't choose and do it you know, properly because I obviously don't have enough left. And I was scheduled to go back for a third one, and um, I was getting a little scared about it because I said, you know, this is going to be my third one. How is he going to fill in everything? He was only going to do like around 1,700 graphs. So deep down I knew that I wasn't going to get the result, you know, that I, that I wanted. I had it scheduled. And then in the meantime, there was a, um, a competitor um, hair transplant firm that came in. They, they come in and do... Um, like they come to New York City, they come to Seattle, they come to Pennsylvania, and they do individual consultations. So like a week or two before I was ready to go to uh, surgery for this third one, I went to New York City and I got really soured out because the person um, that represented this firm was kind of, um, he pretty much put it that the surgery that I had from this doctor in upstate New York was um, pretty much them at their worst if they were to do the surgery. So he kind of made me feel like I made the wrong choices and that I trusted the wrong people. And he kind of insulted, you know, the work that I had done, which wasn't really bad, but it, it wasn't really good either. But well, let, let me really... let me let me touch on that for a second, John. First of all, um, it is, in my view, one of the lowest sales tactics that can be used uh, in the field. I think that um, thank you. By the way. First off, I don't think that it's anyone's right to uh, you know that's, that's conducting a consultation, be it a consultant, be it a doctor, uh, whomever, to to make a patient feel bad about work that they've already had, about decisions they've already made. Um, I, I think it's unfortunate, and you know, 
while Spencer said it's it's a really bad sales tactic, I also think that it's it, it, it might not have been a sales tactic at the time. It might have just been, um, you know, just not the the person just not thinking about what they're doing. Um, well, I think, it's, I think the reason, too, the other thing that kind of got me upset is I, he probably really didn't know what he was doing because he was sort of hungover from the night before from drinking, and he kind of <laughs> made that known uh, on the day that he gave me the consultation. Oh so it was like... All right, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into it, but I kind of have an idea who this is. And all, all, all I can say is this. Um, I actually think it's a really shitty tactic. I really think that it, it you know, I, I'm a believer that the loudest man in the room is the weakest. And if you have to badmouth your competitors and as opposed to just saying, you know what, we probably wouldn't have approached the case this way, but you do have some donor area left. I mean, you, there's a possibility of salvaging the situation to some degree, and this is the way that we would do it in our clinic. That's yeah. it. A, a simple explanation on how they would do it would probably – uh, made you feel a lot more comfortable, and frankly, this guy probably would have made that sale. Yeah, he w he probably would have. And the the thing is, now I'm soured out, and I, I'm probably not going to do it again. So now I got like a big patch in you know my crown area, and I got you know the growth in the front, but I did lose some from those two surgeries. So it's like now, what do I do? Because I really don't trust anybody after having that experience with him. Well, what was the, I'm sorry, the first two surgeries? You, you think you've lost hair from that? Yeah, I did. Because okay, I, that, I, can't that was... be, I can't be on the medication, the Proscar, because um, some issues. So okay, I, fair I'm enough. not taking medication. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So um, the, the subsequent procedures that you've had, were those strip or were they FUE or what, what, what happened? It, no, the, the two that I had were, they were follicular unit grafts. Okay, well, well they're, they're both procedures pull out follicular unit grafts. It's just, um, my question is, when you had these, um, these follow-up procedures, was it a strip surgery where follicular yeah, units oh, were sorry. just... Yeah, it was a strip, two strips. Okay, yeah. okay two, two strips. All were stripped, yeah. Okay, and how did the doctor rate your, your donor zone as far as the density goes? It was pretty high. It okay. Was, you know, it, it's real, it's thick. Okay. Um, but now, you know, the person that saw me in New York said I only had 2,000 left. Okay. Forget what the person in New York said, all right? You just, I mean, seriously, because... Um, well, first of all, the person in New York is not, um, from what I'm gathering, is not even a physician. No, he's not. Right. So the person who in New York you went to see, who badmouthed the other doctor, who had a, a, an obvious hangover, as you put it, is a salesperson. Right. That's it. So yeah. it's his job to try to sell you. And, but you know, he did look at the donor area. Yeah, I mean, but he wants to be he wants he wants to be relatively conservative as far as if you've already had the three strips. You know, he's like, well, you know what? If they go for a much larger session, you can end up getting some some stretch back. So you may not have only had two thousand in the bank. You may have only had two thousand for the next procedure. That's a possibility that you have to true, kind of be open true. to. True. And then, and then, my question is, how much time did he actually spend looking at your donor area? Was it just a quick, you know, lift up the hair, just tug the quick, scalp, and, and sit quick. back down? Yeah. Did he smell yeah, like okay. booze? I don't know. I didn't. I don't know. I don't even. It's been such. A, it's been a while. I, I can't remember. All right. Well, I don't mean to. I don't mean to um, be overly I'm light about the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking for his name. I know. I know who you're talking about. I know everyone in this industry did. I know everybody that you're talking about. I know. Yeah, I knew what doctor. No, thing, I knew what doctor you went to there. originally, and then you said, "Oh, and I went to another doctor in New York." Boom. The original doctor that I said was in New York. So, you don't have to say a word. We want to we'll fill in the blanks. Yeah, we'll fill in the blanks. Yeah. We just want to give you uh, try to yeah, try to give you fill in the blanks, but it doesn't. You know, now I'm stuck like this, and now I don't know what to do. So it's like, who do you trust? Who do you go to? And what's the next step? Well, here's here's the thing. I could understand why it's difficult for you to trust anybody. Um, Absolutely. I could also, you know, 
understand why you, um, well, let's put it this way. The, the person that you chose to go to, was this a kind of a local physician for you as opposed to traveling? Yeah, like in a couple hours. Okay. Now, what made you choose not to uh, travel outside of the, you know, a two-hour, you know, area? Because you've obviously, you've done some research. You went to see another I'm trying to not say the name of the clinic, but you went to see another um, representative of a clinic that I'm assuming you know is pretty well known. What made you choose not to go to that clinic first, as opposed to the clinics that you decided to go to? Because it was like it, it was like really far away. Mm -hmm. It was probably like a seven-hour plane issue. ride. Yeah, it was yeah. a distance issue. Yeah, and they they recommended that I stay there like for. I think it was like two or three days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of expenses and, you know, the plane ride, the car rental, they weren't willing to pick any of that up. So it, it adds a lot more onto the, you know, the ticket. All right. Well, let me, right. let me ask you this. Um, will you, would you be willing to have, because you're asking who to trust. In my view, you have to have several consultations with several different doctors, not salesmen to really get an assessment of what's going on with your scalp. Uh, a good guy to go to in the New York tri-state area just to get an honest assessment would be Bob Bernstein. Go in there, let him do the densitometer on you, let him really check out your scalp laxicity. Uh, he's gonna be brutally honest, so you're gonna have to deal with that. But at least he, when you go to Bob Bernstein, he's gonna say, look, this is what can be done and this, this is what can't be done. And then have another consultation with someone else in the area and see what they have to say. And then after that one, have another. And then you have this, mm -hmm. this, this, you've amassed this amount of, you know, uh, a good amount of information and you can kind of tell who's being honest and who's not. And then you have to make a decision. If you are limited to only 2000 graphs, then maybe there isn't much you can do at this point. It doesn't necessarily mean that you were botched. It just means that you only moved a certain number of graphs. Uh, it sounds to me like you have extensive hair loss. Uh, you just said that you right. can't take finasteride, so you weren't able to stabilize right. your hair loss. So there's a supply, supply and demand issue. Now, do you think that any of the grafts that were placed did not grow? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You do. Now, right. I think there was shock. There was some shock fallout. Okay, but shock fallout of grafts or shock fallout of your native hair? I'm assuming that's what you mean. You mean your native hair when you talk about shock fallout. Probably shock fallout of the grass because when he did the second surgery, um, he went back into to the frontal and put more in there. So it could. I believe that what it did was kill the other, killed some of the other grafts that were from the first surgery. Because the first surgery didn't cover everything, he went in there and tried to additionally cover it and make it denser. And I think that may have disrupted some of the grafts that were in there already and possibly killed them off. And because there's one certain section, like on the right hairline, um, that definitely there's a, there was a lot of loss. The, the grafts that you had from the first surgery, um, can you say that those were definitely taken from the, the, the safe donor zone or, or were they maybe taken a little bit higher up on the sides or, or into the crown area? I believe it was not into the crown area, but just slightly below, like very high. Okay. All right. And I'm, I'm asking these questions and I, and I think it's important to get a, a handle on your case as much as possible without, you know, I mean, we're, we're not going on any photos here, so it's, it's difficult, but, um, did, did the doctor, when he went in for the second session, was he, was he shaving the recipient area? Was he able to, I mean, how, how thick was this area that you were dealing with? How much hair loss had you already experienced by, by that time? Because the reason I'm asking is because if there's not much up there to begin with and it was, you know, a relatively small no, session the first time around, then it, it's, it, it's pretty difficult to cause permanent shock in that area due to uh, physically damaging the hairs. Um, usually permanent shock even if you're not um, 
physically damaging the hairs with, with the incision making tool, the the massive interruption of blood flow due to attempts at dense packing can influence that to some degree, but it doesn't sound like that was what was going on with your case. Well, he was double doing the double, the double follicular units in the front. He kept packing those in there okay. to get an illusion that the front was full. That was his explanation. Okay. So, so he was, he's, you know, okay. on the second one, he went and put those doubles in there to make it look like it was full to sort of like, as he put it, create an illusion. All right, so here, 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 okay. here's the thing. So, that John, yeah, I mean, it's possible that if he was using larger graphs in the front, mm -hmm. uh, the instrumentation needed to uh, create a recipient site for those larger graphs could possibly damage adjacent uh, follicular units. It's possible, but it's pretty unlikely. I mean, unless the guy is complete incompetent, that that was the case. Um, I'm not a fan of putting doubles in the front hairline. Now, right behind the hairline, it can work. Um, I'm still, I'm not a fan of that either. I mean, it's got to be significantly behind the hairline, in my view. However, well, it sounds like he was putting double follicular units, which could have been anywhere from four to six hairs yes. in one graft. Yeah. And if that's the case, then packing those in, you're looking at an incision of well over one millimeter, probably 1.2. Yeah, that can, um, that can cause maybe 1.3. Then, then, then we're talking about potential. Damage. Yeah, yeah. Then we're talking about potential shock loss from uh, that, which uh, could be. All right. So and I'm pretty sure that there was four hairs in a lot of them. All right. So here's the thing. Okay. okay, you're in this position now, and right now you feel like you can't trust any more physicians. You were given an assessment that you have 2,000 grafts left in the bank. What is your end goal at this point? Now that you've been through all this and you're unhappy, um, first of all, and guys, we'll take your calls in a second. Um, do you think that what is on your head now appears to be natural? It's not bad. It's acceptable. Okay. Well, then you're ahead of the game compared to some other guys. But, but, but there's a huge bald spot in the crown. Okay. So it's, what in a, in a, a perfect world, understanding what you understand about hair transplantation, understanding that there is a supply and demand issue, what would you like to see happen for yourself? Probably get more frontal and get some part of, you know, some part of the background full. I know I'm not going to get it all full, but just enough so that maybe it starts to like comb over and cover the, the bald part. I know I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but I just want to be able to make it acceptable so I don't have like a big bald spot in the back. Okay. And you have more frontal. Well, here's, here's the thing. If, if it's true you only have 2,000 grafts in the back, and again, Joe and I are not physicians, uh, that's a limited amount of grafts, which, can, which could make a, a pretty significant impact if it's placed, if the grafts are utilized correctly and placed, you know, in the hairline and the mid-anterior scalp you can get the illusion of more density and actual density. But I doubt, at least if it, you know, it's true that you only have 2,000 graphs in the bank, that you're going to get what you want. And Joe, I mean, maybe you could give a little of your insight. Well, I, I, I think it's, I think it's solid, um, a solid response. But, you know, I'm just, I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about this. I'm trying to visualize, John, what your case looks like. And from the sounds of it, I mean, you know, when you're dealing with the crown, it's it's been said for many years on, on various discussion boards. It's a, it's a black hole, man. That, that it's a black hole for, for graphs. And it's true. Um, so I, I think that you need to pretty much dismiss the idea of any, any resemblance to fullness in the crown if you're even to have any crown work to begin with. And I say that because if you expect more than what you're going to get, then you're going to be gravely disappointed. And you might even ask yourself if it's even worth it. If you can bring your expectations down to where maybe, you know, a doctor can give you light coverage as long as that world pattern is properly and naturally reproduced, then you could potentially, again, sight unseen, I have no idea the size of the crown, but you could potentially establish a good baseline for concealers, um, some sort of, maybe some sort of uh, trichopigmentation or, or a combination of things to where 
these adjunct options can give you a fuller appearance, albeit temporarily, for the crown with that base of, of, of hair established surgically. But 2,000 grafts on its own in most crowns is not going to give even remotely a resemblance of fullness um, or air quotes density. I hate even saying that, air quotes. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, what my point is is that 2,000 grafts in most crowns doesn't go very far. It can just give the, the ground cover, the baseline for, um, for the, the concealers out there like Dermatch, um, you know, topic or whatever. Uh, you know, there, there's so many out there. I don't um, even know if that was accurate, though, his estimate, because he was so, you know. Out no, of no, the granted, day, granted. But... No, I, I, I get that. I get that. Um, another thing I wanted to tell you, though, I, and I'm just going based on this, you know, because this is very limited information. But um, like Spencer said, go have a consultation with Dr. Bernstein. Then go have a consultation with Dr. So-and-so. Then Dr. So, you know, get get three or four good, solid consultations with IH, IAHRS member doctors under your belt. And don't pull the trigger with any of them until you have time to, you know, take notes in each of these consultations lay them all out on your kitchen table once you're done and list out the pros and cons of each one and then put it all away for a month and come back and reevaluate and do the same thing. If they're all telling you the same thing, then you've got a baseline to go by, okay, well, maybe I do have only 2,000 graphs or, or 1,800 graphs or whatever, you know, the consensus is among these doctors. My point is, is get some solid information from these reputable doctors across the board without pulling the trigger. There's no need to pull the trigger. This is a fact finding mission for you. Then you get the information and then you make an informed decision based on what you've got. Call the show, call us back. Let us know what you found out. John, let me, send me, let me ask send you a me question. An email. I'll review it with you and I'll help you, you know, understand what it is exactly they're saying. It's what I do. I help translate what some of these consultations can mean for patients so they John, know exactly I'm, I'm going to cut doing. you off for a second. Uh, John, let me ask you a question. Did you have a chance to meet anybody who had surgery with the doctor you chose before undergoing the procedure? I did. Okay. And were you impressed with, with this person's results? I was impressed with it, but he ended up getting a lot of hair loss after two. Okay. But you were... Uh, that doesn't that doesn't answer the question. Were you impressed with the actual surgical at the results? Time, at the at the time, I was. Okay, it so, was pretty good. So yeah. so what happened? Did he have another surgery? Then he lost his hair, or did he just progressively lose his hair? I think he had another surgery, and um, I think he did get some fallout, sort of similar to what I did. Okay. All right. Well, that's tough, man. You know, I mean, that's and not. He's wearing, and he's actually wearing a baseball cap all the time now. Yeah, that's not the norm that's not usual and it's you know especially if there's a doctor out there that you know you were able to take a look at their work you made the decision based on seeing this other person and then you know for both of you guys to have shock after you know your second or third procedure uh, it just seems strange to me I'm not saying it didn't happen but I can't see how, if that, well, why, if that why was did, consistent I can't see how this guy would continue to be able to practice why does he recommend that you wait a year then? Why do you have to wait a year to, to that's what I don't understand. What do you mean? What, why don't you understand they that? The, they have the next surgery. Well, because that's, that's pretty common practice amongst mo most ethical surgeons. Yeah. The, the reason being is because if you have, especially if you're having a strip, it takes, you know, there's the initial healing, but then there's several months of additional healing that go on underneath subcutaneously where the, the tissue is, is remodeling and reforming, nerve endings are reconnecting. It takes several months for that to happen. Um, not to mention, you need a full year, give or take a, a couple of months, to see the actual final result as far as every hair finally breaking through and starting to grow and maturing. Because if, if you have, for instance, if you have a, a, a procedure and then six months later, you look at it and you're like, I, I don't, I don't like the way this looks. It's not enough. It would be premature to to have a procedure at that point, simply because you can't judge what's not grown yet. Because by six months, not everything's grown. By one year, everything is not only has not only has grown and sprouted, but it also has to go through a maturing process. Like uh, a, a lot of guys will have 
you know, say month eight to, to 12, the hair that's already growing can be kind of rough and coarse and even wiry. Um, but by the time 12 months comes around, it can soften and start to take on the characteristics of, of what it should be uh, doing and patients are happy. You talk to them at 10 months, they're not happy. So one year gives you a, a, the full range of experiences to where you can come up to the final conclusion, you're happy or you're not. Uh, the donor area has finally healed. All the uh, all the grafts that have been place, placed have not only sprouted, but they've also matured and grown to a, a good length. So that's the problem with hair transplant surgery is it, it's, it's the most... Um, it, it, it takes longer to see the final result with hair transplant surgery than any other cosmetic surgery out there, because um, it, it is it is it is watching the grass grow literally. And the other the other issue too is there's one part, one area in the front where the hair loss you know occurred that's got like a ton of colic. It like it, it it's like a wave. It sort of so does that have to do with the area that from that they took it from? That it was the way. Is there a certain technique? that you use in order to avoid that colic and that sort of um, issue in the front? Well, Is when, when grafts are placed by a competent surgeon, they should be placed in a manner that mimics the direction and angle of the native hair that's in that immediate area, if there's any in that immediate area. Um, the idea, there's, there's a theory called the theory of donor dominance where um, the, the genetics of the donor hair is the dominant influencer for how the grafts or for how the hair will grow once it's been transplanted. Well, that's also the we, reason. That's also the reason why donor hair grows in the first place because it's DHT resistant in most cases. So that's, exactly. That's what. But we now from. know that that's not entirely correct because um, there's now a lot of evidence where uh, when the hair is placed, it takes on characteristics. It, 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 yeah. it takes on the characteristics of the native hair that's immediately around it. I right. was talking to someone about about this the other day where. Uh, a transplant of 4,000 grafts in the frontal zone can, once it grows out and it's been maturing for about a year, will actually develop or has developed in some cases a natural wave that is uniform with every hair that was placed. It's it's a hell of a thing to see when you think about it. It's really actually kind of cool. But um, in your case, it, it could be the recipient area is dictating how these, these grafts are growing. It could be because of how they're placed. It could be... Um, it could be any number of things, actually. Uh, again, it's sight unseen. I, I can't. I can't really comment specifically. You know, honestly, unless, unless the grafts were placed, and we're going to take another call in a second, John. Unless the plat grafts were placed, you know, either in the completely wrong direction or perpendicular to the scalp, for example, um, you know, it's possible that, like Joe said, donor dominance kind of took over. It's possible that particular area of your scalp did grow wavy, uh, but when you had all of your hair. Once it was all, you know, together, you didn't notice that that particular area was a little bit more wavier than other parts of your scalp. These are all possibilities. It's also possible the doctor just fucked up. You know, that's a real possibility too. Um, you know, I guess all I can, all, all I can advise you to do is to have a few more consultations with physicians, not salespeople, so that you can at least get a, you know, an assessment of what's going on. And, you know, someone who's ethical, someone who's going to tell you the truth, um, you're probably not going to hear them badmouth the surgeon that uh, performed your prior surgeries. Uh, they're probably just going to say what they can do, what they think is, you know, uh, you know, in your best interest, and if it's even worth having surgery to begin with you know, or another surgery, they may just say it's not worth it. So right. I, wish I, wish, I wish we can give you a definitive answer say, you know what, if you go to Dr. X, you know, so-and-so, he's going to be able to take care of you and you're going to get what you want. That's just never the case. Every time yeah. you have surgery, it's a risk. And you have to kind of assess these risks and understand that you could be the worst case scenario. And honestly, it sounds like you, you may be, you know, kind of in that category. Maybe not the worst case scenario. But not the scenario that you were thinking case. of. I don't think that's the case, though, because I got my hair is like really super thick in the donor area. Super thick. It's like really, thin. you know, the doctor made comment of it that it's probably one of the thickest that he's seen. So what's not the case? The, you, you're telling me that your hair is super thick, but you're unhappy with the transplant. So that is the worst case scenario for you. 
So something's not right somewhere. It's right. either the surgeon or... Right, that's exactly what I'm saying. That, and they say that, three you know, strikes and you're out. I'm on my third one already, so I might as well just forget it, I guess. But that's exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, you know, even in the best hands, things can go wrong. So, you know... Yeah, there, but the problem is I want to get in the best hands and it hasn't happened. So I don't know how to do it. Fair enough, but you also have to understand that, you know, if you've had these multiple strip surgeries and if you get to the point where the the issue becomes one of laxity, where you don't have enough vertical laxity in your donor scalp for another strip or or enough hair to get the job done, then you might be the perfect example of strip out before you start with FUE. Um, because if you have such a thick donor zone, in other words, the density is still very high, but your laxity is low to where your scalp's too tight, then FUE might be an option for you. Um, that's that's what I'd have to do right now if I want another surgery is I'd have to have FUE because I've, I'm stripped out. I've had as, as many strip surgeries as Look, I can Look, all, all I can tell you, John, have. and I think this is a good first step. Uh, you're in the New York area. Make an appointment with Dr. Robert Bernstein in New York to at least get an assessment of what's going on. And he'll be very honest with you. He'll tell you how much he believes as far as the next strip is, is possible. He also does FUE. Uh, and he, he does robotic FUE, but at least, you know, he's been doing FUE for a long time. And frankly, he coined the term FUE. So at the very least, he's going to be able to assess whether or not you can have another strip and then maybe go in and get another thousand grafts or so via FUE. Um, but you don't have to have surgery. Just get but he's the, very conservative also too, right? He is appropriate. Let's put it that way. So my yeah. advice is to at least get an assessment. So would you rather go to someone who's, who's a conservative, that's appropriate, that's trying to be safe, or someone that's just going to take out the biggest strip possible and kind of just gamble your, your graphs away? I just want someone that's going to just tell me what the deal is. You know, this is good. This is the deal. This is what you got left. Go to Bob Bernstein. Go to Bob Bernstein. Okay. He'll, he'll give you the, he'll give you the truth. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right, man. Listen, Thank thanks you. for the call. I wish you the yeah. best of no luck problem. and I wish we can give you, you know, information that would make you happier, but we're just telling you the truth, man. All right. All right. Thank good you. luck. Take All care. Right. All right. Bye. Triple eight, six, five, nine, three, seven, two, seven. I was trying, dude. I was trying to help the I know. guy. But it's as though know. he just well, he didn't want to listen. What well, can I my, tell impre you? my impression was that he he's 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 under the impression that um, that he is a candidate for one of these really big sessions, or or he may he may kind of regret not going to a clinic that does really big sessions. And I, I just I, I can't help but think that's like well if he did and then and then he had issues. It's like game over. I mean, yeah. once you have these big sessions and if they fail, there really isn't any going back. All right, let's see who this is. <laughs> hey, man, you're on the air. Who's this and uh, where are you calling from? Hello, Spencer. Oh, Jesus. That waiter in Santa Monica is wrong. You have beautiful hair and pretty pubes. <laughs> Hi, my name is... My name is, my name is Joe from Staten Island. My name is, excuse me. My name is, well, I knew we could may reiterate it. My name is, my name is, my name is, have you heard it? <clears throat> excuse me. My name is, my name is, my name is, Joe from Staten Island. Pretty cute. <laughs> it's actually kind of sad that, you know, we have to have like a fake Joe from Staten Island calling in. It's the faux Joe. It's like those fake uh, Donald Trump guys on the news. They're great, man. They're hilarious. Well, let me just say, you're not having this person call in. I'm calling in on my own volition. Well, yeah. And I'm on a mission. Yeah. And I'm doing it on my own, and if he doesn't call, then, you know, it's comforting for me to hear that. To hear that Joe from Staten Island Eminem soundtrack is comforting for me and maybe for some other people. I'm keeping the Joe spirit alive. I'm keeping, I'm keeping the Joe train moving. I hope he doesn't hate me because it's all for love. You know, it's all for love. Dude, I, I listen to me. It's like you're honoring Joe from Staten Island every time you call in. Exactly. You know, and let's not, let's not, let's not. Well, I'm not. It was about to curse. Let's not screw around. We we know he's listening. I know you're listening, Joe. <laughs> you know, that's that's you know, it's not 
not not not anything anybody's putting me up to. I'm doing it on my own. I, I will say this though: that Gary Coleman thing cracks me up every time. Oh, yeah. What a jerk, man! I mean, he probably was a good guy in real life, but that was a jerk of a session. I mean, he screws up the first take. He goes, take the, first. He goes. First, he's sitting there, like, going, okay, what's it called? What, yeah. what is it? Well, play it, man. Okay, let's go. <laughs> like, asking questions. And then he screws up the first take, and then not even, like, usually you want to pause and wait till someone's ready. He goes, take it. Let's, and then he goes again. It's like, it's like take two action on his own accord. And then right. he sits there, and he goes again, and then he calls it two takes. Look, let me, let me, let me, let me oh, tell you, man. Time is money, baby. Let me, let me tell you something, man. And let, let, <laughs> let the guy rest in peace. But, um... He had a lot of issues, uh, at least in my opinion, from what I was able to see when he was in studio with me. And uh, we had this girl, she was a young girl, who was a call screener, screener at the time at Westwood One. And this is a true story. I know this is after the fact and he's dead, but um, it's not a legend. This, is, this happens, I'm gonna say it. This guy was like in love with this girl's feet and was going under the desk trying to kiss this girl's feet. Now, we're talking about at the time wow. the guy must have been 40 years old, maybe older. Yeah, I knew there was something freaky about her. I don't know if I heard it on Stern or some other talk show or whatever, but I knew there was something kind of freaky about him. He was an angry uh, dude. With he, women was, he, was a, he was an angry little dude. And listen, I really appreciate the fact that he, you know, did the promo. He was on the program. Uh, but he didn't, he just, it was just for airtime. Like, he didn't, he didn't know who the fuck I was. It was actually very funny to me. That I'm like, hey, so you want to do an ID? Hey, hey. He's like, sure. Huh. And he, he was on the show to talk about whatever, or he was just hanging out with you? What? Um, my buddy, Kent Emmons, who at the time was the president of National Lampoon Radio, brought him in. He was hanging out with him. He was actually friends with Gary Coleman. Oh, okay. Kent was on the show talking about his hair loss. And then he's like, you know, invited Gary to come into the studio. So Gary sat in and, you know, bullshit a little bit. And then I'm like, look, man, you want to do an ID? He's like, yeah, no problem. And then after, you know, he fucked it up twice, he's like, hey, we, this guy's going to have to pay me. So he didn't think that I was going to leave that in when we edited everything. <laughs> Everyone just thinks you're going to go with a polished ID. But, but I thought that was that's hilarious. Why, that's why you're always in the entertainment business. You always want to be pleasant because the people working behind the scenes, if they like you, they'll, they'll, they'll go out of their way to make you look good. Yes. If they, if they don't yeah. like you, they'll, they'll be like, well, you know, here's a bad take or something. Well, might I actually, know you know, to be clear, I actually liked the guy. He was very nice to me. And um, I just thought that that was a funny take. So I told yeah. my editor at the time, like, listen, leave all that shit in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, good move. It's, yeah. Pretty, it's pretty hilarious. Yeah. Uh, I uh, just did some acting this, this uh, last week. And um, it was uh, pretty. It, it was basically a, a project to um, to uh, educate um, people who are trying to be. I'm trying to see if how much I could say. Um, anyways, it's not a movie, it was, it, but it was still acting. They paid me to be a, a fictitious person who, and they just gave me a skeleton outline of the person and w what his needs were. Right. And it was the. Uh, it was actually the LBGT community, and they, they're here to, they're here to use it. Like, I'm supposed to portray a real person. They're here to use it to train other people, professors or whatever, in the psychology world to kind of get them to understand how to address this. Because back in the day, they didn't have any of that, you know. If anything, they're saying, like, how do you, you know, in the 80s, if you were gay, and they were like, how do you help a gay guy? I'm like, well, let's hook these uh, electrodes up to him and shock the shit out of him, you know, they'll say something like that. But now, like, there's so much more. There are still people who believe on. that, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, the evangelists and stuff. They yeah. have so many different... Uh, and it's funny when they find a gay guy who's willing to say it works for them. You can totally tell it. it well, you know, well, you know the, what, uh, what, what's interesting about that is that there are gay men out there who are so desperate not to be gay because it affects their lives and, you know, it affects who they are yeah. as a person and how they're, you know, uh, how people relate to them, at least in their minds, that they will do anything not to begin. That's why I always say, you know, how can it be a lifestyle choice when it's such a difficult thing for so many people to deal with? You know, you're born that way. Yeah. That's just the way that it is. Yeah, yeah. People don't choose it because it's not an easy life. It's not an easy road. I mean, it's easier now, thank goodness. But well, we uh, can learn some from the the gay community because once they embrace it, like we don't want to embrace being bald or losing hair, 
once you embrace it, anybody who embraces it, shaves their head or just says, F it, I'm going to be bald guy, their life becomes more liberated and their quality of life improves. And it, it's hard for us to agree to that. They don't, a lot of the bald sufferers don't, don't, don't want to accept going into that world. They don't understand that there is, just like the story I tell about the hot lady model chick who comes in with the bald guy at the bar every freaking weekend. He came in again this last week, and I have to look at him. And, you know, like, she chose that guy I, over me. I agree, I have, but I know. think it takes even more guts to be me. It takes even yeah, more guts know. to say, you know what, I'm fucked. I'm so fucked up. That I started, I created an entire career around my hair loss. If you mainline I, I, I was going to say uh, that, that, you know, c comparing this to coming out, like, it's actually, you, you can't really compare it because even in the LBGT, add a letter, you know, I don't know if I got all the letters right, LBGT community, you still, if you're yeah. bald, you're bald. Squared. Like, it's, it, bald people are ostracized no matter what their sexuality is. So what are you going to say? It's, I, it's, I mainline what? Because it, it sounded like it was going to be a compliment. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what the uh, what the description was that I was going to say now, but uh, I was basically saying you own that. Like that's probably like your drug now is to be so upfront with what you're going through and what you do for a profession that you need that. That's like a survival thing. Like I, you know what? I, I would I would I'd venture off and say that if you ever did go fishing. And put up the sign yeah. that said, screw this, then be a part of you that misses being able to say that. Say, oh, yeah, I have this, uh, you know, not, 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 for the, not for the whatever, you know, the prestige of having your own show and all that. I'm just saying to be able to admit to somebody, this is what I go through, this is what I do, I try to help others. There would be a part of you subconsciously that would still try in some way, shape, or form to say, that's what your life's about, and that's who you are. Because it is for so long, and, and, and it probably does provide to you psychologically a comfort, you know? And because I know that feeling, like when I talk about the balding buddy, the guy I talk to, yeah. uh, that feeling is great to talk about it, even when we're talking crap about ourselves. It's not, no one's talking, me and him are saying, oh, you look better than me. He says, you look better than I do. And we're like, nah, I look like a, you know, we make jokes about each other's hairs to our, about ourselves. And it feels good, and maybe that that part is is actually crucial to you. Well, it's definitely that, it's cathartic. That's the word, and it's definitely has changed my life. And it is a big part. It is a big part of me because I kind of need to explain it away. You know what? If we're going to be screwing, you know, like if I if common law and I ever you know decide not to be together, you have to understand that you can't touch my hair, and these are the reasons why. And you know, unless you want me in for the night, or unless I have to go and take another shower. No touching of the hair. And even then, it does, I'm not comfortable with it because you may get paint in your hands. And that, when you said, Go ahead. When you said if, if we are going to be screwing or talk of the golf me. Not you and I. <laughs> not you and I. Not Joe from Staten Island. Oh, oh God. This is, oh, my God. <laughs> my dreams this have come true. <laughs> dude, that was, the, that was the guy from uh, Silence of the Lambs, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That fucking just freaked me out. <laughs> Maybe that's what's going on in the basement over there. You never know, man. Yeah, there's many times he's listening in his, his butt naked or in his underwear. You know. But look, I will tell you, I was actually looking at a uh, a property for you know in the Beverly Hills area. Of, of, there's a good chance because things are kind of um, getting to a point where I need to have people in the studio more often, and I'm out in. You know where I'm out. And so I may actually have mm. to get a, and it looks like it's going to happen, a big studio, you know, a little bit more central. And so I'm looking at a property and, you know, this woman is walking with me and, you know, she was asking me what I'm doing and what it is. And she's like, who would have thought that you're, you know, you'd be like the bald guy. You're like the famous bald guy. I'm like, I'm not bald. <laughs> yeah. You know, but that's how I'm, that's how I'm looked at. I'm like yeah. the bald guy. Even though well, I have hair, very bald the guy. bald truth. Right. You know, I understand that. It's a part of that. Yeah. No, I get it. I absolutely get it. But it's a very, like I said, if you would have asked me 30 years ago, if I would be doing this today, I would be like, you're out of your fucking mind. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. Yeah. How's someone yeah, going to make a living doing than, that? I, I, no, you no know, one in high school was like, you know, voted the most likely to be a successful uh, business person in the hair loss industry. Right. 
you know, I was I was actually voted to be most likely to be a game show host. True yes, story. I could see but that. No one. <laughs> well, I can see that too. Yeah no, yeah, no one endeavors to be in the hair transplant or hair loss industry. I want to get you one of those thin mics that they had like in the '60s and '70s, uh, <laughs> a match like, game. B- Bob Barker. Yeah. <laughs> I always wonder why is he holding that thing? It's like it's like a little. Uh, it would look like a musical instrument. It's like, like a, a really baton, small, like a little. Flute. Yeah. Yeah. Like what was the point of that? And you know, it was a really shitty design, in my opinion. It's like a bamboo reed that you beat your kung fu students with. And you know, honestly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I guess they didn't have wireless mics back then. It, it maybe seemed a little bit more delicate and easier to to hold than kind of like you know one of these SM. What are these fifty-fours? Uh, these are the regular mics that you see people singing in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's weird. And then, it, and then it just became its own thing. It became its own icon. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to get one for Joe. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think he should do it for his YouTube uh, videos. He should use one of those. Well, I, I can I can do I that as my my next green screen, where um, I I make myself out to be like a Bob Barker type of uh, yeah. game show host. That'd be awesome, man. Yeah, I want to buy one of those. Uh, one of the where you guys get those those little foam walls you guys got. Because with I'm gonna get LED light. I'm gonna put that in my bedroom. I'm gonna set up a mic. And when people come in, when girls come in here, I'm gonna say, Oh yeah, I have my own online show. Yeah. And, and it's just gonna make their panties go. <laughs> Dude, it's like uh, Ru- Rupert. Right what is it, Rupert Pumpkin from uh, um, what was the name of that movie? Robert De Niro. Uh, uh, King of Comedy. Did you ever see that? Uh, which what's it called? King of Comedy. King, King of Comedy. Robert I De Niro, Jerry Lewis. So basically, De Niro uh, lives at home with his mother, and he has this set in the basement where he ma- he's a, he's a he's a budding comedian. He wants to be a comedian, but he never does any, you know, live you know stage shows. He never performs for anybody, but he does this um, like Tonight Show type of talk show. In his mother's basement, he has like cutouts of Liza Minnelli, <laughs> and you know, it was really uh, Sammy, Sammy yeah, Davis. Yeah, so it's it's the exact same thing. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna try that out. That's a good what movie. Is, uh, man. Well, it works. Chicks dig it. I, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, but Dude, yeah, just like get some cool know. cameras. I'll tell you how. Yeah, I'll tell you what to get. And you know, you can like kind of do some podcasts and just have like a little website, and you never have to do another one again. <laughs> Spencer, how do you not know that you need an external hard drive to record these shows on at some point? Well, I how do, do you not know that. I, I do know that. I, I do know you. that. And you didn't tell me to buy one. No, you didn't I, tell I, me to hook it up. I have several external hard drives. However, he was just here, and he didn't warn me, like, you're going to need to plug in a hard drive soon. And I haven't been checking. And there's, like, no oh. warning light saying, you know, hey, you know, your disk is about to be fill, filled. Yeah, you figured there'd be some sort of like gas meter somewhere that you can instantly yeah. uh, look at. You'd have to you have to go to the Apple and put preferences and stuff like that, or look at it. Well, um, what I was going to uh, say about that story is when I did this project, um, I threw a bone at the bald community, and what I mean by that is they gave me three scenes, and I did uh, I did two of them talking to this therapist. I cried a little, and it was very it was the first I've done a lot of acting, but it was the first acting scene where I did something and I felt really complete after I was done because they gave me a lot of freedom. It was like a 10 minute scene, no cut. So I could go anywhere where I wanted to go with the story. So I cried a little bit and the therapist talked to me and blah, blah, blah. And they cut and the director comes over. The director's crying. The girl in the back's crying. Everybody's freaking crying. And I'm like, oh my God, this, I, that was good. I, they, I wow. affected people. And so there was two scenes where I'm with the therapist by himself. The third scene is they bring in my supposed lover. And apparently an actor had a, had an emergency, couldn't show up, so they got an actor on the fly. And this guy, he he didn't really cut it. He wasn't really following – because once I started talking in my scenes, I wrote the script. At that point, right. that's called writing the script at that point because I'm making up my own stuff. I gave him my backstory. I told him everything about me, who I was as a person, and he wasn't following it. And so the level of – not to toot my own horn, but the quality level of the first two scenes was pretty freaking high. I mean, when the director and everybody else knows you're acting and they're still crying at the end – like they're all they, even the therapist has watery eyes and he does this for a living. You know they're pretty strong scenes. And so he comes over and it just it's not working, right? So at the end they basically say, Hey, you know, come me loose and then they asked they asked they took me in the room. It looked like an HR moment. They're like <laughs> and they got everybody out of the room and there's like four people around me, the producer director was like, 
how do you feel if we recast? And I'm like, oh, okay, I didn't do anything wrong. Right. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> they go, uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, he made some off-color jokes, and this is a serious city. I, okay, yeah. And so I'm like, well, yeah, find someone. So they go, go find somebody. And they start making calls. I go, do you mind if I, you know, call some people? And they're like, yeah, sure. So I called two people, both of them balding or bald. Ah, um, good move. I, I, they're friends and they're actors, but they're also like, this was a this was a, a chance to because I know sometimes they, they feel that way. Right. I called one and he and and uh, he immediately goes, I don't want to do a gay role. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, but oh, how great it would be, guy. you know, to have have this guy and I guess the other one came to do it, but you know, a, a balding guy who has you know a life and has a relationship. That's awesome, man. I just love that concept. Well, you don't see that. It's encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, it definitely makes it realistic. And I'll have you know, I was the trophy wife, just so you know. I was 15 years younger. Dude, so come on. With your, I, with your with eyes and that, that hairline, forget about it. <laughs> no, well, I called the second guy, and the second guy shows up, and I told him everything. I said, let's not make any jokes. And both of us are straight, and they knew it. And that's one of the pitfalls is, is that when they know you're straight and they're trying to get a realistic gay role, they but, think that we're going to be cliche and all that stuff. And they want you to make out. Oh, yeah. Well, thank God that didn't happen. <laughs> um, no, that because <laughs> it was a therapy session. They wanted to stay away from obvious things like saying I love you to right. each other, you know, because they, uh, and doing things like that because they say it's therapy it's serious and they already know that. It's already set forth. So we didn't have to do that. But he knocked it out of the park and – at the end of it, you know, they were like thanking me. Everybody was happy. We were happy. And I, you know, and like, no, everybody in the room was like, you know, misty eyed. And they were like, it was so powerful when you said this and when this happened. And he, he did this really great thing. The therapist complimented him. We go in the other room and there's three other girls sitting down on a couch watching the monitor with tissues in their hands. And we're really? like, oh my God. This is it. Yeah, we're playing, we're poker facing it. Like inside as an actor, when you see that, you're like, yeah, I nailed it. But now, you're like, oh, thank you. Course. But the, the important out. thing is, did it get you laid? Uh, that's the next question. Oh, man. Well, see, here's the that's thing. That's a no. That, <laughs> that, that, is the diff- that is the difficult thing because when you, it's like, it's, it's, it's like when you have, it's like going out on top. You don't want to put yourself in that zone. You know, like you already they're like, what an accomplished actor very, very professional. Well, he it's easy to say that in. when yeah. you don't get it. That's the thing. He's a great actor, but he's really lousy in bed. You don't want that. <laughs> no, it's it's the fact that you're going to sit there and say, hey, uh, you want to go out? And then they go, oh, I got a boyfriend. Or, you know, oh, uh, you know, it's not professional to do that. You never know where we'll go with that. Hey, let me tell you something. If I was like, single, and I, I'm not kidding you. If I was single and it's very possible someday that could happen, who knows? I would ask out every woman who passes, any attractive woman that comes in, in my, within my field of vision, I'm asking her out. Well, that was the second thing. There was, they weren't, the, the most attractive woman left already. She was an actress in that scene prior. All that and, and, it, and if I'm drinking, right. she doesn't have to be that attractive. She just has to be, you know, <laughs> okay. Come on, that's the universal truth. We all already know that. If you're drinking, it goes down like two or three octaves. You can and if she's, you make out with a frog. if she's young, and this is what I've learned about myself. If she's really young, like whatever, under 30, then certain things that I would have not been interested in as far as a person's appearance kind of disappears now that I'm 52. It's the weirdest fucking thing. So, she could, so she's below 30. She could be. She could have like a Barbra Streisand nose, and I'm fine with that because she's so young. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you're, just, you're just looking for that it's kind of bad. skin, that kind of. Flex, flex back when you when you flap it. That's what you're looking Well, also, for. I think it has to do with children. Let me tell you something. And uh, common law, if you're listening, you know, it may be just too much information. But the truth is, um, common law has still retained that. And guys, you, you, you guys are going to understand that. That youthful smell. I'm talking about just you know emanating from her, her body. And I hug her, whatever it is. It's something that women who have children just lose. It's some sort of bizarre hormonal shift, man. And all of a sudden, it it's like they smell. They smell like fucking mothballs. So what? Yep. <laughs> I said they, they they bequeath that smell to the babies. That's why the babies. That's smell what so it good. is. Like the it baby sucks the, the baby. It's like the baby. Oh, the baby like sucks the life out of them. 
It does. Well, I, I'll, I'll say this. This is no joke. To this is politically listeners. incorrect. I'm sorry, girls. I, listen, I love, there's a lot of great-looking moms, hot moms out there. There's no doubt about it. But it's just, I don't know. It's got to be scientific. Maybe there's a study out there. I don't know. Well, I'll round the corner with you, and I'll say this. Older women have their own attractive qualities. I oh, do like... Me well, too. it depends. I don't want the grandma smell, but there are certain uh, characteristics to an, uh, an aged woman who has... Let me tell you like, something. I don't mind the grandma you know? smell because it reminds me of, like, uh, Mr. Salty Pretzels. Remember those? Oh, my God. Every yes. time I went to my grandmother's house, it had that smell, but I always got pretzels and water. And for some reason, that was the greatest day. You uh, may, may not mind that smell, but we're talking about sexuality here. We're talking about being, you know, aroused in the bedroom. You don't want a pretzel smell, right? You don't want a, a I, peanut I, smell there. Perhaps I would. I don't know. Maybe it would, like, bring back some great memories. Well, put a couple babies in common law. Let them pop out. Raise See what them. changes. Uh, I don't want to ruin her. I, I do not want to ruin her. She's perfect the way she is. That, I'll, I'll agree. I will say that. Yes, definitely. Like, you know, it, we, we t you talk about her a lot, and I'll, I'll tell all the listeners I've met her. She is a wonderful woman. She does look uh, in her 20s, in my opinion. And I haven't got close enough to sniff her, but I tell you what, Spencer, <laughs> for you, the next time you come in, I will give her the creepiest hug, and I will sniff for about five I'm seconds. I'm telling you, this, this really – and she doesn't even wear perfume. Just take a deep breath. It's like – it's just so youthful. I can't explain it. The, the difference is when she's still young and she and she's still young and then you cross over. It's the difference between, you know, just the, the smell of the smell of youthfulness but she's and young. vitality versus she's, desperation with experience. No one knows her. So I could say she's almost 40 now. So, I mean, this is a woman. She looks like she's yeah, 24. She look at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's also because she all, takes yeah. care of herself. She's always, you know, kicking ass. So that helps. I'll yes. Tell you, Nothing, I, nothing's getting stagnant. Correct me if I'm wrong. If we talked about this in the past, but I accidentally dated a young girl. I well, not accident. Well, it was. I knew she was young. By the way, guys, bad. I don't mean to cut you off. Uh, guys, hold on. I will take your calls in a second. So uh, it's triple eight six five nine three seven two seven. There's a, two guys who are holding. So I will. Um, All right. You know what? I, I, I'll let you get to them. They they need some. They need their time. I've taken enough time. You really, you really have. No, honestly, it's always a pleasure, man, <laughs> talking to you. So. No problem. All right. All right good guys, job on, so good good job on the gig last week. Oh, yeah. Congratulations oh. on the gig. Thanks. No Show problem. it to me. Maybe I'll cry. I don't know. I'm an emotional guy. Well, if they guy. send it to me, that's a, that's a problem when El in Hollywood. They rarely send you the project, even when they promise you. But if they send it to me, I'll definitely will. It's an educational video, so I don't know how I'll get it. Hey. So, but I'll let you know. All right, man. You take care. Thanks for the call. See you. Okay. Triple eight six five nine three seven two seven is toll free number. Let's see who this is. Hey, you're on the air. Uh, who's this, and where are you calling from? Oh, hey, am I on? Yes, you're on. Oh, hey, it's it's Al from Houston again. Al from Houston. Hello, Al. What's happening? Hey, I called last week. I had a question, uh, totally unrelated to what we talked about last week. Honestly, so, did I have no clue what we talked about last week? None. <laughs> My friend gave me some medical marijuana the other day. And I've, I completely think I've lost my memory. Uh, I, I was the guy I called just to give you follow-up after my second F-U-T. Right, okay. With? Ring a bell? With who? Who I didn't say. I didn't oh. say. Oh, you're one of those. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I had a good result. I wasn't one of those. He was happy, anyway. with, he was happy with his result. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally unrelated question. So I was in an airport uh, a week ago or a few days after the, the show last time. And you tend to see a lot of hair transplants in the airport. I think just yep. because it's a lot of professionals traveling, people, you know, who are more, um, you know, more uh, paying a lot of attention to their appearance, et cetera, want to look younger. And I saw a guy with a really, Obvious. really bad, yeah. uh, looked like an FUE result. And I, I was like, so when you say it looked I like an FUE to... result, you're talking about you were able to actually distinguish and he see looked, his. He looked over harvested and kind yeah. of, you know, a rectangular pattern in the back of his head. And he had yeah. the graphs were in place. Like, like he just looked bad. Yeah. And I was sitting next to him at the, you know, at the gate, like waiting to board the plane. And I was like so close to saying something, you know, but, but I was like, but I didn't. And the question is, you know, when you guys are around the world, Joe, you especially, 
if you saw somebody like that, would you sort of reach out like kind of nope. in brotherhood, like, hey, man, nope. I don't are do you it. okay? I, I don't do it. The reason being is I have no idea what headspace this, the guy is in, uh, and it's not my, my place to just out of nowhere make the guy feel uncomfortable. I, I, I just – I, I can't do it. And it's very possible that this guy just thinks that this is the way that it is. He looks better than he did yeah. before in his mind. And, you know, why should we destroy his fucking day? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I didn't say anything, but I will not lie to you. Like, it was it was hard. I kind of, you know, like, I wasn't, like, going to be like, ha-ha. I mean, I wanted to sort of reach out, like, hey, man, are you okay? I mean, it didn't look good. I, I mean, I don't think he's walking around thinking I look good. Well, here, here's the thing. If I yeah. saw some guy... I happened to be in the strip mall, perhaps, you know, where there was a, a guy who's wielding a neograft and just, you know, never performed surgery before. If I saw some guy walking into that facility, it's possible I would stop him. That's about it. However, and again, nothing, nothing yeah, against the neograft. The neograft, neograft itself has come a long way. I'm just saying there are doctors who buy these different devices and they don't know what the hell they're doing. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously that's a scenario that would never occur. But as far as, you know, there are times in my life, and many times, I see a lot of bad hair transplants. Um, I have thought about having a card. I have thought about, you know, there was a guy here in L.A. that actually started this thing, and um, he was a printer. And he was a fan of the show when we were on the radio. And he would put out these guerrilla marketing stickers and it would say are you a friend of spencer with the website and he would put him like all over clubs in los angeles just on his own he wanted to do this you know yeah. so there was a while i was thinking you know what maybe if that got big enough we could i could have a card like you know i'm spencer or something like that but that's the only way that's the only, it has to be like a yeah. secret society well, and i guess yeah. that way you're letting them reach out to you right it has to be it's a it has to be a secret society and I, you know, and, and I guess Joe now, what, obviously. What's we're, the handshake? What's the handshake? We're the, I'm the king and Joe's the crown prince of this goddamn thing. <laughs> and it's ridiculous. But maybe the, maybe the handshake could be you put your hand up, but you pull back two fingers so it's like there's fewer things sticking up. You know, there's a little bald spot in the middle. We could, basically, we could just maybe, maybe just <laughs> go like this. I don't know. You can't see that, but... So, Joe, I mean, Joe, when you walk around, do you have, like, hair transplant radar on 24 hours a day looking at people? We dude, all, it's in my sleep. We all do, dude. It's in my sleep. It's like I, it's like I, I can't turn it off. I just can't turn it dude, off. Dude, my wife and, could pick out a hair hair transplant or a piece from two miles away. Yeah, she just. I mean, she's been involved with me for too long. It's. I think it's adversely affected her life. My wife will right. will will, uh, will come home and say, "Yeah, I went to the post office. I saw this guy. He he had like great donor hair." Yeah, <laughs> or or we'll, we'll we'll actually be at a restaurant and she'll she'll be like, oh, he's got good donor hair. What do you think? Yeah, is he is he a Norwood three? He's a three, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm glad we're not doing. I'm glad we're not doing. Can I have doing, my beer? Can I just I'm, drink my beer? I'm glad we're not doing the small penis show. I, no, no, that would <laughs> that would be a problem. Uh, well, anyway, well, I didn't say anything to the guy, but I was sitting next to him. But it was—I will not lie—it was hard not to say something. I felt terrible for him. I saw a guy in the airport, very similar uh, circumstance. I think he had FUE as well. He had the sixteen-nine aspect ratio on the back of his head, like a like right. a flat screen TV. Yeah. And he had perpendicular, you know, graphs placed, basically just sticking straight up. Very low, like weird rounded low off temples, line. and you know, just mm -hmm. hard, just. Hard. Horrible, and this was a—he was a good-looking dude. This guy without his hair may be like print model material, even bald. So he really got fucked up. I can wow. say that one thing I would do is, like you said, you're sitting next to this guy. Was it sitting at the at the gate or was it the bar in the in the airport? No, it was the gate. It was the gate. We okay. were getting ready to board. You yeah, could open up your it. laptop and just go on the ball truth and like make sure he's seeing <laughs> you, it. You could, yeah, you could. But um, it's like if I was sitting at the bar waiting for the next uh, connecting flight, um, I'd pull up my business. I'd, I'd start going through my business business cards that I collect, and I'd pull up my own and put them on the on the on the counter while I'm going through the other ones, just just to maybe start up a conversation. But never ever would I would I engage to to start that conversation. Um, maybe right. make it easier for them to, to start. But 
you know, it, it's all at their, at their discretion, their comfort level, not mine. All right, well, if I'm in this situation again, I'll hold my tongue. Listen, I got a break, but I just wanted to ask you guys that real quick. <laughs> All right, dude, listen, yeah, thanks course. for the thanks call, man. All right, thanks. All right, take care. Triple eight six five nine three seven two seven. That's something I struggled with my entire career, actually. Yeah. And you know, I see a lot. I see a lot of really bad work, and I also see work that can be repaired. And my thought is, you know, do I intervene? Because he's probably going to go get another surgery. And it's possible he's going to go to the same doctor. And, and, and you know how much better it can be just by looking at what, what's on the guy's head. But absolutely. you also don't know what his own impression is of it. He may be perfectly happy with it and not be aware that there's anything wrong with it. Yeah. You know what? It's, you know? What's funny about a bad hair transplant, as you know, Joe, now you have great work done. But um, even ones that aren't quite as sparse and as pluggy as yours – you know, if it's stalky, if, if it is anything that is not natural to the eye, people will look. And there's no doubt you cannot deny you when people are looking. You can't hide it. But you can't avoid. You also know. You know when people are looking at your hairline. So the hairlines that I'm talking about are the type of hairlines that everyone would just be like, what's going on there? Yeah, but I've actually had consultations when I worked at, at clinics where guys come in and my first reaction is, oh, repair case. Yeah. And and they're they're just when when the the word I've actually had the the word repair questioned. Like, what do you mean a repair? Yeah, what's wrong with me? You know, like like it, no, literally. It's like yeah. so it makes sense what what you're saying, but there are guys out there that don't understand that what you and I would look at or the average person would look at as being unnatural looking isn't unnatural. They're, they're just like, what do you mean it's unnatural? It's what do you mean a repair? This, I, I just want more hair. Well, I'm I, happy with this. I, I, was, just, I was sent a, an image. It was actually an ad, an online ad, or a guy um, who writes a blog and I guess basically promoting his physician. Um, and I was sent this image by another physician. <clears throat> I'm not a physician, obviously, for those who are just tuning in, by, by a physician who I uh, know well and who is part of the IHRS. And the caption on this image was, I loved my hairline so much. Actually, no, it was from, a, uh, it was from an article. I loved my hairline so much that I decided to do the same with my beard and have a beard hair transplant. And the guy showed an image of his hairline, and it was like, Dude, this is unbelievable. It was like I haven't seen anything like that since like the late 80s. But really, this particular person, well, I, you know, I would say early 90s, early 90s. I mean, it, it was dense, but, you too know, dense. it was too <laughs> dense. It was like straight across uh, hairline, you know, the doubles and triples in the hairline. Just, I mean, I guess, I guess maybe if the guy doesn't wear his hair up the way he was pulling it up, that he just has a lot more hair. So he's happy. But it really ends up, you know, it is about expectations and it's also about how people perceive themselves. And that guy who was walking in the airport, that this caller, what is his name? I forgot his name already. Said, looked horrible. May not even, it's possible he doesn't know. I know it seems yeah. impossible, but it's possible. Yeah. It is. It I, is surprisingly possible. I've met a lot of women like that in, in my long life. <laughs> it's just a whole nother who think they're the hottest <laughs> things in the world and you're just like you can't possibly believe that can you and they're all talking about the curves and shit you know and yeah just like all right well listen that's fucking awesome good for you the curves shouldn't include cottage cheese though well <laughs> you know some people have cottage cheese and they're thin but yeah i mean the, there's difference between uh being having curves and being obese it's just i've yes. got to put it out there yes and this may not be politically correct but you know what for whatever fucking reason hair loss is like the last bastion of political incorrectness so i want to talk about this i definitely believe that beauty is in the eye of the, of the beholder but the truth is medically there are people i mean there is a threshold between just being a healthy weight and being overweight and obese. That's just reality. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a health issue. It's a health issue and it's also an appearance issue. Let's face it. So, yes, it's great to embrace yourself. 
You know, I'm all for that. But if someone happens to call you heavy, you just got to embrace that too. Embrace the heaviness because that's part of you. That's just reality. Yeah. Someone makes fun of my comb over. I embrace it. What am I going to do? This is me. And you just got to be you, man. Just got to be me. Triple eight six five nine three seven two seven. Guy, you just hung up again. We got a few more minutes for uh, for phone calls, so feel free to give us a call. Triple eight six five nine three seven two seven. The good news is, even though I'm unable to record this program, it's apparently being recorded in New York. So hopefully, we will be able to get the podcast out to you guys. And uh, there's probably um, guys in the future right now listening to me. Isn't that weird? In the yeah, future, yeah. from right now, in the future, like in a week. <laughs> Actually, it, takes, it probably takes me two weeks to get the show. In like two weeks, some dude in the future is going to be listening to us. I don't know why. I just had flashbacks of Conan O'Brien and the skit he used yeah. to do in the year 2000. In the year 2000. In the year 2000. You know what's really weird? I saw, I was watching Conan O'Brien for the first time on, what is it, TBS? He, he's awesome. In a long, yeah. long time. Yeah. And... Uh, it happened to be when I when I tried that medical marijuana. Oh my god! And at least Rear in my I'm mind, so at least in my mind, he turned into claymation. <laughs> so well, he still got the hair for it. Right? Yeah, but he's like a caricature of himself now because he's an older dude. Yeah, and like all of his exaggerated motions when he was twenty nine or thirty really worked. Now, it's possible, it's possible because I was ripped that they weren't working that well. I, I think that probably had to, something to do with it. But those exact, just that, you know, you know, all that shit and his hair, head movement and this exaggeration of everything that he does, at least in that state, and at least now that I know that the guy's, what, he's got to be 55 years old now? He's, he's yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, close to it. Yeah. It's a terrible thing, but it's almost kind of like you need a new, uh, you need to kind of get a new act a little bit. In my view, I mean that that was a young man's game. Well, watch him without the the medically prescribed um, medication. Dude, I, I wouldn't be up that late otherwise. Yeah, and the, and then and then get back to me on that because I watch I I don't watch him often because I don't have cable television. I refuse to have it. But um, when I watch the clips on YouTube or um, or wherever, it's, it's like when he when he picks on his producer, it's just hilarious. Um, what well, he's got. He's a talented dude. And I'm, listen, I'm not taking anything away from the guy, but I think there's a certain yeah. threshold. It's like, you know, when Michael Jordan decided, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give baseball a shot, you know, at least well, there's a shtick. It's like, yeah, there, there's a shtick that he's got. That's, um, that is more of a young man's game. I, 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 yeah. I, I will, I will give you that. Yeah. It's like, even, you know, you, you would watch, you know, Jay Leno, he evolved, you know, into this older, you know, type of, uh, he was still doing the same shit, but he just kind of evolved. It matched, it was age appropriate. I hate to say it, but you know. Let, no, okay, hang on. He was always safe to begin with. He was always low key to begin with. He didn't have like these, he wasn't very animated to begin with. No, he wasn't animated, but he, I no. definitely saw his, uh, his, his material and his, what is it called? His, uh, not approach, but his, his shtick, whatever, just evolve. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I I look at it as as being modified for a more family friendly audience since he became the Tonight Show host. That's right. that's why I look at it. But we're gonna take a quick phone call triple eight six five nine three seven two seven. Then I'm gonna go get something to eat. Hey man, you're on the air. Who's this and where are you calling from? Hey uh, hey guys, it's uh, it's uh, Mike from New York. Mike from uh, New York. A times. Hello Mike. How's it going, How's How it going bro? Good good. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad, not too bad. I, I uh, you know, the mental notation that I wanted to call you guys, and it's Tuesday night, and, and then I probably realize I'm getting you guys towards the end of the show, so thanks for uh, you really are for, uh, picking up the call. Let's go, let's pick it up, dude. Four minutes. I'm just come kidding. on, man. Chop, chop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I just wanted to check in with you guys. Um, you know, uh, I, I I got back on uh, the Propecia about six six months ago. And I am starting to, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm going through a shed. I don't know, you know, when that, when that shed happens, but I'm just trying to figure out 
potentially what's going on. I mean, I'm doing things that I never thought I would do before, like, you know, counting the hairs that are falling out in the uh, bottom of the, uh, the, <laughs> the shower when I get out. And it's usually about 20, 20, 25 I'm finding. Um, but that, I'm trying to figure out if that's kind of normal. That's not bad. It's, on. you know, I mean, it really, I mean, some of the, some of the hair is obviously going down the drain, but that's really not bad. Yeah, I mean, when yeah. you're clogging your drain and you pull up like a hundred hairs, that's, a, that's a problem. And mm -hmm. it's possible you're going through a, a slight shed. It's possible that when you got back on Propecia, you were antigen, you know, more uh, of your hair synchronized as far as going into being pushed into an antigen phase. And that happens. Look, I was uh, on Fine Asteroid for about eight months, and then all of a sudden I was convinced that it stopped working. But there was nobody talking about, I mean, there, there was nothing online about it. There was no one talking about uh, the dread shed or Fine Asteroid sheds. It just didn't right. exist. So I didn't know what was going on. I just upped my dosage to like 7.5 milligrams a day. No side effects, by the way, at least immediate side effects. Who knows what this shit's going to cause, you know, down the road. But right now I'm fine. But so I would say that it sounds pretty common. I mean, that's usually around between three to eight or nine months. That's usually the time people go through like a synchronized shed mm -hmm. or even a slight telogen in the fluvium. Uh, how, how long has it been since, uh, since, he, since he started uh, Propecia? Eight months. I think six, he, months. six months. Six months. Six months. Six yeah, months. Six okay. Months. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you have so. to think about what the medication is doing. It's resetting the, the growth cycle. It's – and – you know, you, you got growth cycles where you're in telogen for anywhere from three to five months before it kicks back in into the antigen state. And, um, you know, it, it's just a normal part of, of taking the medication. You might have some sort of shed that is temporary and, um, you know, usually just stick through it and it levels out and you're fine. And you actually start to kind of rebuild on top of that if you're a good responder. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, you know. I know Spencer uh, remembers, but I you know I was all, I was on uh, uh, for for quite a long time, and then when I had my uh, my, uh, my we were trying for our, our first child, I got off. Yeah, and then you we went on generic. And, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just trying to, but I don't remember exactly what happened last time. So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, at what point do I do I realize this stuff is working not working you well, you, know, well, you knew that it was working you got to give it a year you 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 had found you already said that you had seen gains and improvement when you got back on the name brand right i don't know if i saw improvement oh wait there's another guy i'm sorry i'm first sorry time. i'm sorry yeah, no, yeah. Helped. i helped i think it helped the first time i was on right um the first time i was on and then i was off it for about 5 years uh, had you know? Let me ask you a question. How's the kid situation? Are you enjoying your children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, just had the uh, just had the second one uh, not that long ago. So now do you like your kids yeah, more than your hair? <laughs> of course. Okay. Well, there you go. Then you did the right thing. Because <laughs> um, I'd be all bitter. One. What's that? I'd be all bitter. Yeah. I'd 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 be <laughs> like really angry with my wife, and you know. That's why I just chose not, just, not just even to deal with it. Just as long as, you know, you know, if I'm bald and, you know, the other kid's parents' dad comes and picks them up and, you know, as long as they don't say, how come, how come so-and-so's daddy has so much hair on his head and you don't have any? Yeah. Well, they, well, they will. That may happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. what they do, man. That's what kids are supposed to do. Yeah. Point out the obvious because adults can't. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, I know. I know. Um, so one other quick question before I go, because I know, I'm sure, like I said, at the end. But um, does what's your take on the combination of utilizing, you know, the the, the hair products like the Nanogen, the Topic, you know, and hairspray and stuff? Do you guys, in your experience, know if if that can interfere with what's going on with? either propecia or just cause more hair loss? You know, first of all, it's really unlikely. And unless you are, I mean, I cake on the hairspray. I cake on the Dermatch. Um, 
there, there's really no reason. I mean, your hair is manufactured. It grows underneath the scalp. So unless you are somehow mechanically damaging the hair, the whole thought of having, you know, even the chemicals or kind of like a plastic layer from hairspray on your scalp, it's not going to affect the manufacturing process underneath. So, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, what do you think, Joe? There, there's not an issue where, you know, I've, had, I've read people or, or heard where people have said that you need to let your hair breathe. That's complete and utter bullshit. Yeah. It's like it, you, the hair that we – this hair that I'm pulling it's that you dead. may not be able to see, it's dead tissue. It's, yeah. it's, it's keratin that doesn't have any sort of life to it. The only life is in the, in the follicle itself where it's producing the keratin and pushing it out. Um, so, so there's no breathing per se. However, I can say that I've seen one case where um, someone was using too much uh, topic. They were, they were oh, taking dear, it yeah. on. They did have a hair transplant, and this was after the, the, the transplant was done and healed and everything. But um, Topic got they, into the scalp. Topic got into uh, the, the, the pit yeah. of, uh, that was created by the, uh, the, the tool, and, and, and again, it had already healed. I mean, this is, just, this is many months or even years after the fact, but he was caking so much on and leaving it on for days and even weeks without washing it wow. that it created an infectious issue uh, low, low grade infection in the scalp and it was actually killing the hair. I mean, he was, all these pimples were forming and it was just, wow. it, it was nasty. And, um, that's the only, only case I've ever seen where, uh, concealer of any sort, this case being topic, now, caused any sort now of Now this issue. was, was he using it during his healing process? Or this is I don't, I don't believe so. No. Interesting. Um, I think he started using it after he lost more hair, um, which is well after the procedure. He, he, he's from Italy, so it's it's the, the work that he got was really really bad. I, I I still I still know who the doctor is. He's one of the worst in the world, in, in my opinion, and that's that's saying a lot. Um, and this poor guy, he had the surgery, had all the shock loss, the grass were growing. Uh, his only way to address it was to start using lots of concealer and he became addicted to it, which happens to a lot of people. Yeah. And he, and he would leave it on for literally for like it. a week and a half, two weeks without washing it off. Um, how would he, a, well, he just, he didn't wash his hair. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. It's <laughs> I've seen yeah that's when I feel crazy stuff, starts, man. Uh, if I, if I go, that's, that's kind of when it starts to freak me. I don't want to say freak me out a little bit, but you know, the weekends, the weekends come, you know, I take my shower Friday, Friday morning, um, sometimes, you know, and then I, and Saturday, I mean, I'd always, I mean, I'd always take a shower. Um, and then Sunday, you know, the morning comes and then I hit the gym and start doing stuff around the house. And then before I realize, you know, it's Sunday night, I haven't showered since Friday morning. And I'm like, man, I got all the shit, you know, this shit on my head. No. I hope it's not. I know, do that. I do that. I, listen, it's not dude, causing problems. Dude, I, yeah. I work in my box of shorts. All right. There are times when, you know, I'm not showering till, you know, I don't have to, till like three in the afternoon. Do my workout, yeah. maybe swim, whatever it is. Uh, and then I jump in the shower, you know, to, to do some recording and, you know, whatever. So it happens to me all the time. I've been wearing this shit in my head for, for 15 years. So I would say that at least for me, and I never had surgery, I've never, you know, and, and I cake it on. I really do. Um, and I've, I've never had any problems. I've never known anyone to have any problems. And frankly, Joe, that was the first, you may have told me that story because it kind of sounds familiar. But that's the only story that I've ever heard where uh, that happened. And this is someone who had surgery sure. first on the ball truth. So I wouldn't worry right, about well, it, man. I, I, yeah, you're fine. All right. Well, I appreciate it, and I'll, I'll leave you with a, a funny, a funny uh, thing that happens to me. Maybe every other day, um, at some point, I was listening to one of your older programs um, on my, you know, through my Bluetooth system on uh, on my uh, in my car, and I, you know, stopped listening to it whenever this was months ago. And every now and then, and I, you know, I've, my phone has shut off and shut off since then. I've cleared my cookies, whatever, whatever you have. Yeah. And every now and then, 
I turn my car on, and I'm smack dab in the middle of that. Of that, you're uh, kidding me. Yeah, it is the really? funniest thing, and and you know this. You know, my wife doesn't really know. I even. I mean, you know, I, I would tell her that. You know, I've listened to you guys, but I don't. You know, I don't think she would kind of even understand kind of what what happens and what we talk. You know, what you guys talk about. So it's like. I'm waiting for like the car to turn on, and that happens, you know. And you guys pop on. She's well, why don't you just what the hell are you listening to? Turn off your Bluetooth. <laughs> and I, yeah, but it's it's the most bizarre thing. I mean, again, the battery has run out. Really? Plugged it. I've done everything. I turn the car on, and you know, sometimes I could be listening to you know Spotify or something, and I hit stop, and then. There you guys are. <laughs> right well, I mean, listen, it could be it could have been porn, right? You know, yeah, it could have had some moaning going on. So count your blessings. <laughs> count your blessings, <laughs> dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate everything, guys. All right, and, man. Uh, next to you guys. And don't point. be embarrassed by the bald truth, man. I get it. I would be too. Embrace it. All right, What's dude. That? Embrace, Embrace it. it. Embrace yeah. it. Take care, guys. All right, take care. Bye bye. <laughs> I, I do. All, right. Going. All right, bye guys. Jesus, eight minutes after the hour. We started late, though. We started late. Yeah. Guys, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, hopefully, you're listening to this on a podcast, and that's really going to be up to Suncast now. In the future. Yeah, in the future. At some point, you guys in the future are listening to us now. It's wild. It hasn't even occurred yet. And it's going to, you guys are listening to the past. That and night, they've captured time. It was one, one night of medical marijuana, and I still think I feel it. Guys, I want to <laughs> thank everybody for tuning in. The websites, The Ball Truth, Jesus, excuse me, TheBallTruth.com for uh, archives of this broadcast. Also check out Guys from Queens, that's uh, GFQNetwork.com or GuysFromQueens.com. You can check out our message form on BallTruthTalk.com. You can check out Joe Tillman's website which is hairtransplantmentor.com he is the man with the answers when it comes to hair transplant surgery so contact him <laughs> uh also american hair loss association uh, americanhairloss.org if you're considering surgical hair restoration great first step and i wholeheartedly believe this this is why i founded the organization Check out the International Alliance of Hair Restoration Surgeons at IAHRS.org. Just remember, it's just a good starting point. Just because a doctor has made the grade doesn't necessarily mean that they're the doctor for you. So do your own due diligence. It's a great place to start. That's IAHRS.org. And uh, what else? Did I forget anything? I think that's it. I think that's it. All right, guys. I know I'm forgetting something. AmericanHairLoss.org. You can check that out as well. Listen, guys, until next time, be strong, God bless, and thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next week. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for any inconvenience you may have been put to prior to the program, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. And if you could now leave by the exits at the rear, that would be splendid. Thank you. Good night.